this is painful. Uh, I don't know how else to say this or share this or say what for basically, <clears throat> basically, uh, I just got done recording the episode and something went wrong and the whole thing came out as a black video with no audio or video, no visuals. I just read these two chapters and basically I have to do it all over again. Uh, because that's how we roll. We don't, uh, we don't, uh, we don't walk away. The, the work, the work must be done and I'm the only one who's going to do it. So, <laughs> oh my God, where we last left off, the toe cutter and his vile gang had, uh, you know, accosted Jesse and Sprague and, Max came to the rescue. They we met the the dark one. We learned that May is his wife, even though there's a weird age sort of there's a sort of age difference between the two of them, right? Like, you know, in the movie, he's got to look like you know late, late, late thirties all the way through mid forties. The dark one. I mean, we could pull up a picture right now, but I'm too lazy, especially after the ordeal I just told you about. So basically. <clears throat> But basically, he doesn't look the age that May does in the movie. But yet in the book here, in the novelization, it seems that they are a married couple, which is really weird. But that is that seems to be the reality. Um, so, yeah. So in any case, uh, the the gang, they are after we know what's happening they're they're after max james just that max jesse and sprague and we will let's 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 start let's jump in with chapter 17 they reached the service station at which max and jesse had found kundalini's hand less than two and a half hours behind them remember they find the hand then they call the dark one which is what also happens in the movie so this is the destination at which they find it Although I believe in, oh no, yeah, it also happens. That, right, right, right. That makes sense. That makes sense. They walked in on the owner in force, belligerent, threatening, and asking questions which would allow no attempt at lies. When they left, 15 minutes later, they had not only torn apart his display counter and relieved him of his cash, they also knew that Max and Jesse were heading via minor roads for a farm. It was a small but vital clue. We are, see, and it's stupid that, you know, this is such, this is so redundant. We already know this from the previous chapter. Why on earth do we need to know about it again? Well, there's more of that coming, folks. I can tell you because I just recorded this episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, had they headed instead for the Transcon or even one of the other superhighways, they would have missed their quarry for sure. Less than 200 miles in front of them, Max and Jesse had stopped three times for directions. Too bad there's no map quest or even uh, you know GPS or anything. Then they then they'd be okay. And at last, they had found on the side of the road a gate with the name Swayze painted on a board next to it. Keep remember that name Swayze. It's gonna it's gonna come in handy later on in the story. Max got out and unhooked the gate. Jesse pulled the van into the driveway. She eased the van through the narrow opening. Max closed it behind her. Safe at last, she thought. So she thought. They trundled down the long winding dirt road through the paddock after paddock until at last they saw an old style homestead squatting on a hill in the distance. When Jesse pulled the van up alongside the steps leading to the front ver veranda, I love that word, veranda, veranda, sounds like a Southern, you know, uh, a Southern farmer's daughter, veranda, go, go, go out there and fetch some sweet tea and biscuits for our guests. There, uh, there, they were there, they were there at the veranda to meet, there at the veranda to meet them was a woman in her late 50s. It was May. So in the book, she's in her mid fifties, which tracks a lot more than what she looks like in, in the movie. She looks way older. She's got to look like her in, in her mid to late seventies in the movie, which does not track with the dark one's age. She had her gray hair tied up in a simple bun. Her skin was the clearest of any woman's that Jesse had ever seen. And though she wore old fashioned, 
clothes that were not fashionable, even Jesse could recognize the look of quality material when she saw it. So clothes were made out of a quality material. Though May had never met them before in her life, she greeted them like long lost friends. In the movie, it seems like they do know each other like before this. Uh, welcoming them to her home and shepherding them inside where coffee and scones were laid out on her best dinner service. She was, Jesse and Max soon found out, a compulsive talker. Well, it's peaceful here, all right, she said, replying between mouthfuls to praise Max. Uh, 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 oh my God, I hate the way that this is written. This is not written well. Well, it's peaceful here, all right, she said, replying between mouthfuls to the praise Max had been heaping upon the countryside. It's like Yoda fucking wrote this thing. I'll give it that. Peace and solitude are nice so long as you have someone else around to tell you so. I think one of those clever French philosophers said that. Or might he have been a German for all I know, but I'd read it somewhere. Anyway, it's a change for us on our holidays and all, Jesse said. Oh, that's what the Dark One used to think. He used to love his holidays, but he doesn't come up here as much as he used to. I guess he explained that to you. Uh, Jesse felt a tinge of embarrassment, but Max gave a simple yes in reply. The conversation lilted along until both Max and Jesse pleaded fatigue and May showed them and Sprague to a large, comfortable room. They didn't realize how tired they were until they sat down on the soft old mattress and with Sprague alongside Jesse, they fell into a deep sleep far from the cares of the day. While they were sleeping, the tow cutter and his troopers were weaving their way through the countryside, slowly tracking down the van and the occupants. They must have taken at least four wrong turns. What's up with everybody taking wrong turns? Seems really hard to, to get to this place traveling down rarely used roads until they came to some sort of civilization and then demanding information. Each time they realized that they were on the wrong road, they would turn back, retrace their tire marks, and start again from the last intersection. It was a slow, laborious process, but the tow cutter had a debt to pay, and nobody, least of all his personal lieutenants, were going to quibble about the time it took. Gradually, they closed in on Max and Jesse, Gradually, the miles which had separated them diminished, and at last, in the afternoon, they found a general store tucked in the corner of the road and hit the jackpot. Mudguts sauntered in, perhaps because he was tired or perhaps be he, perhaps he just forgot to be unpleasant. The man behind the counter was treated with uncharacteristic pleasantness. Unfortunately for Max, Jesse, and Sprague, he was only too willing to help the young men on the motorbikes, so... Because Mudguts was such a nice guy, he ended up sealing the fate of Jesse and Sprague, it seems, unfortunately. Yes, he did remember a van fitting the description of the one their friends were driving. Because, of course, Mudguts was like, hey, my friends. Ah. Um, oh, and he was very sorry that they had lost the address of the farm they were holidaying at. No, he couldn't remember a child, but then the young lady hadn't gotten out of the van. He was sure that it was a van, though. After all, hardly any traffic used the road, let alone stopped at his store these days. And they had wanted directions. Sure, he could remember. This is written so poorly. I can't. Terry, I love you. I love what you do you've done with so much stuff. But this chapter is excruciating. Hadn't he helped the young fellow look it up on a, in the map? He found it pretty quickly. He found it pretty quick smart the first time, even though his eyes were no longer nearly as good as they used to be. It was no trouble at all to get that map out again. That was that was it there, the first turning along the old turnpike. Road. I mean, how does he, like, what, was he smoking crack when he was writing this? Called Falcon Bridge Road. No doubt of that. Sure as the sun would rise tomorrow, that was the road. We really needed to know that. Sure as the sun would rise tomorrow, that was the road. Thank you for reassuring us, Terry. Now, I'm, I'm just clearly bitter because I had to reread this already, and I was already foaming at the mouth about the redundancy of this writing. Now, as to what the farm, 
Now, as to what the farm they were looking for, now, as to what farm they were looking for, that was a mite more difficult. The young fella had asked for it by name, and he couldn't quite recall, but it was definitely on Falcon Bridge Road, and there couldn't be too many farms still inhabited down that way. It's like, why do we need to, why do we need a friggin' detective story about how the fucking toe cutter found the farm? Hang on a minute, though. It was a strange name, like a girl's name, but not quite. Daisy, maybe. No, but that was close. It was on the tip of the tongue. If only they could just wait a minute, it'd come tumbling out. Daisy, Maisie, Lacey. No, none of those. But there couldn't be too many farms, and the name rhymed with those. Mudguts, for once in his life, managed to be polite. He thanked the old man with something approaching affection and pushed a $5 bill across the counter. The old man looked at him in astonishment, and for a second, before pocketing the money and decided decided that young people of today weren't nearly as bad as most everybody thought. Mudguts joined the others outside. In a hurried conference, he passed on the priceless information. The toe cutter was elated and repeatedly slapped Mudguts on the back. How far we gotta go? How far do we gotta go? 10, 15 miles maybe, and then we gotta find the farm. Takes us about an hour if we're lucky. <laughs> Mudguts replied, good, I can tell we're going to be lucky. Don't worry about that. And then we're going to have some real fun. The toe cutter chortled. I love that word chortled. What a word, chortled. The others broke into Pearl's peals of laughter, which were drowned in the roar of the bikes. With the toe cutter and Mudguts leading the way, they wound deeper into the countryside. They found the turnpike road without any difficulty and swung around it with a rising tide of excitement and expectation. Barely 15 minutes later, they passed a little used road, its entrance almost concealed by an over by the overhanging boughs of the surrounding trees. The battered signpost long faded into illegibility. Their directions and all of their intuition told them that it was Falcon Bridge Road. Cutting, cutting their engines to a minimum revs in case the forewarned in case they forewarned their quarry, they were led sedately down the road by the toe cutter. For some reason, we need to know all this information. We really need to know this, Terry. At every gateway, they would stop and inspect the surrounding area for a signpost, a mailbox, or any other indication of who, if anyone, might inhabit the unseen homestead. It was a slow painstaking business but the bikies so easily bored as a rule took to it with rare zeal time and time again they stopped inspected both sides of the road and then remounted their machines it was mudguts who saw it first at least it was mudguts who realized the significance of the sign first Bubba Zanetti, traveling on the side of the road nearest it, pointed it out with no more than passing interest. Mudguts, who had been attempting countless permutations of the name Daisy, hit the rhyme in one. Daisy Swayze. Remember that name I told you to remember? Swayze. He let out a whoop, kind of like, you know, the insane clown posse, like whoop, 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 whoop. Uh, <laughs> he let out a whoop and then stopped the others dead in their tires. Quickly, he unhooked his legs from the saddle and ran to check the spelling. The toe cutter, too, had grasped the significance of the name, but it had to be carefully explained to the others before light dawned. The toe cutter indicated with a jerk of his hand that he wanted to brief them before they went any further. Well, we've hit the jackpot. The chickens have come home to roost, and what a lovely, deserted little nest they have, too. Nobody, Diab Diabondo added. Nobody to disturb the fox. It brought a roar of laughter, which died as quickly as it had begun, thanks to a thunderous look from the toe cutter. Just shut up and listen. Now we're going to go very quietly down this laneway until we get a good look at the house, and then we're going to wait. Finally, Clunk couldn't res resist the question. Why, toe cutter? Why? Because Terry Keyes thought it was so important that he spent an entire fucking two pages explaining all this stupid exposition to fucking readers who fucking confidently know. Because George Miller, his motherfucking self, fucking knew that this shit didn't need to be in the Mad Max movie. And the Mad Max movie, story-wise, is truncated, as we know, because they weren't able to film certain scenes. But still, 
because Terry fucking felt the need to write this, we are going to fucking read it. Thank you so much, Terry. The toe cutter gave him a withering look because I said, we'll wait. And if I say we'll wait for a week, then we'll wait for a week. That's enough reason. But just for your benefit, you steel brain fool. And so that you won't have to ask the damn stupid questions in the future, I'll tell you. The chick had a guy with her. That's what the old man at the store said. And there might be more people up there. Farm hands, friends, brothers, uncles, and the devil knows who else. Understand? Clunk nodded his head. The toe cutter continued. So we're going to wait. And everyone's going to have to keep quiet and out of sight. Then, when we know exactly who is up there, we'll go in and start to pluck a few feathers. The toe cutter didn't wait for any more questions. He merely indicated the gate to Clunk and remounted his cycle. Clunk obediently wheeled his machine to the gate, opened it, and allowed the others to pass through and closed it behind them. Slowly, they purred along the dirt road, their eyes scanning the countryside for any sign of life, the thrill of excitement spinning through their stomachs. Almost silently, they rode along the meandering track following the contours of the land down the hills and over the crests until they saw the homestead standing on a rise in the distance. Quickly, the tow cutter motioned them to accelerate down the incline off the crest where they were sticking out like sore thumbs. At the bottom of the hill, he told them that they would keep going, but would have to make sure that they were over the rises as quickly as possible. It was a demanding exercise keeping the bubble, the burble of the bike's engines to a minimum while maintaining enough speed to take the hills quickly. Gradually, they worked their way towards the homestead until Toe Cutter, no longer confident that the sound of the bikes could be heard by some sensitive ears across the silent paddocks, waved them to the side of the road. Relying on example, he got his troops to bump their way across a drainage pitch and into a tangle of saplings and underbrush. Even Clunk realized that they had to conceal their bikes from the road and the nearby fields, and, with the others, positioned his bike so it was hidden from all but the most careful eye. Barely a word was spoken between them as the toe cutter, crouching low, began to jog across the open space to another clump of trees on the top of the small hillock. In his hand, he carried bits and pieces of a sawed-off magazine-loading shotgun. The others, Johnny the Boy, Bubba Zanetti, Mudguts, Clunk, and Diabondo, strang straggled behind him. The toe cutter was already lying in the grass, secretly enjoying his fantasy of being a renegade commando. He screwed the butt of the barrel of the rifle and then attached the top of it to a monstrous telescopic sight, which had not been designed for the gun, but would now admirably fulfill the function of a pair of field glasses. The others lay near him, their leathers crushing spindly grass and dry twigs, while the toe cutter sided on the house. Because we really fucking need to know this shit. Carefully, he swiveled the focusing controls until the building stood up bold and clear in the crosshairs of the sight. Slowly, he ranged the tip of the barrel along the walls, making fine adjustments to the focus and elevation as he went. He picked up the corner of the veranda. Veranda, come over here, get some sweet tea for our guests. Delved into the shadowy recesses, tracing his way around the windows, up and down the French doors, and past the support pillars, because we really need to know all that about the house. Lingering on the sagging cane chairs, hesitating at a hammock, and finally picking up the corner of a vehicle as the front of the door crept into his sight. Abruptly, he swung the gun a couple of inches until he had the van square in his view, held there for what seemed like an age to others then let the barrel fall. Without taking his eyes from the house and talking in a voice softer than a whisper, he said, there it is, the van, all snug and hiding away in the countryside. And she thought she could get away. They were straining to catch his words. Kundalini will be revenged. And she, as she ripped his body, so shall she be ripped as well. Nobody moved. The weight of the passion and hate in his voice held them like a vice grip. There will be a time of darkness now in this place. The hills and gullies will be our witnesses. The riders of the storm are waiting for their moment, and none shall stop their fury. The toe cutter trailed off, leaving his words hanging. The spell was cast, and all of them 
were loath to break it. The toe cutter had given his orders. No quarter would be given. Minutes passed before he pushed the shotgun towards mud guts. Watch the house. Tell me when they move. The toe cutter rolled onto his back and staring up at the clear blue sky, closing his eyes tight against the light while mud guts eagerly pulled the gun to his shoulder. As his leader had done before him, he swept along over the building, establishing the position of the doors and settling down to wait. Imagine, imagine if we, when eventually, when we read Mad Max, uh, when we read Road Warrior, the novel, the next novelization that we have in the series, and we have to hear uh, a painstaking Terry description, Terry Key's description, Kay's description of that scene where Max is looking at the, uh, at the oil pump, uh, uh, you know, whatever the, the great Northern tribe and, and the, uh, the humongous gang back and forth, it's going to be painstaking. Uh, chapter 18, the heat bore down on them like a weight, but no one thought of stripping off his jacket. Johnny, the boy dozed fitfully. Clunk was happy to watch the crickets and ants go about their busy lives. Diabondo, mud guts and Bubba took in took it in turns to watch. It was a thankless task. The balance, they balanced perpetually on the edge of expectation, afraid to lose concentration for a minute. Diabondo saw May 1st. He was watching the far corner of the house, sweeping the site along the veranda. Veranda! For what seemed like the a thousandth time, when suddenly he was past her, he pulled the barrel back in the other direction, fixing on her left arm, then bringing her into the center of the site as she walked out the front door. Instantly, Diabondo was shaking, the toe cutter out of his reverie come sleep. The toe cutter grabbed the gun, jammed it to his shoulder and searched. He found May at one of the windows, opening the shutters and attaching the fly screen. He examined every detail of her as she struggled with the large frame and traced her as she walked back into the house. He lay in silence, his cheek riveted to the stock of the gun, then spoke to the others by now as alert as he was. An old woman, that's all. An old woman struggling to do a man's work. He kept the gun at his shoulder, its weight carefully balanced in his hands, his eyes watering slightly at the corner. Seconds passed, his body tensed, every muscle was rigid, his eyes strained through the scope, looking way, way beyond the crosshairs. A man was moving in front of the door, a tall, well-built guy in jeans and a t-shirt. The toe cutter began to swear under his breath, a string of meaningless, unplanned obscenities. The man walking to the rear of the van turned his back on the toe cutter and began to lift tools off the tray. The toe cutter pushed the gun to mud guts, urging urgency, scraping the edge of his voice. Look at that and tell me what you see. Look! Mudguts took the gun from his hands. After a minute's search, he locked the sight onto the van. He kept it there until the man turned around, bending to put a bag on the ground. Mudguts tried to focus on the profile, but it was gone in a second. Impatiently, he waited. The man continued to rummage through the back of the van. Mudguts caught sight of a woman at the front door of the vehicle. There's a man and a woman! Forget the woman! Look at his face! Do you know him? Mudguts brought him back to the center of the crosshairs. I can't get him. Turn around, you. Holy hell, it's the cop. I'll tell you, it's that bronze bastard. The others began to bombard him with questions while Toe Cutter laughed. Ah, 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 ah. It's the cop that got you, Johnny. The one who wasted the night rider. Maxi, 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 the Toe Cutter said in a tone bordering on affection. The others grabbed for the gun. The Toe Cutter ignored them. We've got you now. Oh, have we got you now. Who would have thought that that dumb broad would have led us here? Father, mother, and child, all in the sights, all waiting for the storm to break. The Toe Cutter took the gun back. He watched as Jesse swung a towel over her arm and strolled towards Max. Unblinkingly, the Toe Cutter observed the silent conversation. He saw Max walk almost out of sight to the front of the van. The bonnet reared up in his lens. Max returned to the back of the van, picked up his tools, and still talking to Jesse, vanished behind the van. Patiently, the Toe Cutter held the scene. Seconds later, he saw Jesse turn away from the homestead and move down to the paddock. A couple of times, she waved over her shoulder, then climbed a fence, headed to the thickly treed forest, and disappeared.
The toe cutter allowed the others under his direction to sight through the lens and spot what Jesse had, where Jesse had entered into the forest. In a low voice, he explained his pan. Bubba, mud guts, you'll go after her, but I don't want you to harm her yet. Have you got that clear? They nodded their heads. Scare her up a lot, but don't let her see who you are. I want her to start screaming when she's still back in the trees, so that when he goes, he'll have a hard job finding her. Have you got that straight? They nodded again. Get going then, and keep low. We don't want anyone from the house seeing you. The two of them scuttled back from the crest of the hill and set off parallel to Jesse, using the slight rise above to shield them from the sight of the homestead. The toe cutter then turned to Clunk. You stay with the bikes to make sure nobody finds them. Diabondo and Johnny, you stick with me. We're going to get closer to the house. Now keep down, for God's sake. Clunk began to stand up. A vicious kick from the toe cutter cut him down again. Bend over and run, you idiot. The toe cutter watched him go. Once he was satisfied that Clunk had gotten the hang of it, he and his two lieutenants crouched and headed down the incline to the gully. It was hot, tiring work. But when they scrambled up the other side, it brought them within 200 yards of the house. Still crouching, they settled beh behind a low, tumbled-down stone wall, which had once been used to divide paddocks. The toe cutter, still cradling the gun in his hands, watched Max work. And that brings us to chapter 19. So we're going to stop there. So what's interesting is, are we going to get a better, now that we have a better understanding of May and the dark, the dark one and all that and the farm and the relationships, are we going to get, and we got this incredibly unnecessary two chapters, are we now going to get a better description of who the hulking fellow that follows Max around, who also makes a cameo in the Road Warrior uh, tied to one of the vehicles of the humongous, uh, that actor, uh, who I always just assumed was either a ward or maybe it was May's son or somebody. I don't know who he is, but I'm hoping that he will be more thoroughly explained in this book, as well as I'm also hoping that if we can spend this much time figuring out how the toe cutter got to the friggin' farm, that we could spend even more time in the third act in the movie. The third act only takes up about 10 minutes, right? It's super truncated. We know why it was truncated production, this and the other, but Will perhaps things be more elaborate and explained in the ending in the novelization? That is my greatest hope for this novelization. It's it's delivered us a lot of interesting treasure, and it's also provided a lot of frustration, uh, kind of like these two chapters did. But in the end, we, we love you. We love you, Terry. Just in the way that we love Riot Stickers, our sponsor here. And I'll tell you something. Our deal with Riot Stickers has changed. We are now doing a thousand stickers for sixty nine dollars. Sixty nine, my favorite order. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, for real, sixty nine dollars for a thousand stickers. Those are three inch by three inch stickers. You cannot go wrong with that deal. Link is down in the description. So get ten dollars off this already incredible deal. The the go to the link, uh, riotstickers.com backslash from us. We also have another deal that Sharpie from Riot Stickers has just instituted, where you can get uh, two hundred die cut stickers that are roughly three inches in 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 size. Uh, die cut stickers are stickers that are cut in um, uh, any shape that you can imagine. So they're not going to just be rectangled shaped stickers, unlike the thousand stickers for $69 deal. And you can get 200 of those for $79. That is a super rad deal. You really can't go wrong with either one of these deals. They are great values. We love Riot stickers and, and the, the value that they offer the viewers of the From Us channel. So make sure you check it out. Last thing that we need to do is play our special video. So we'll see you next time with chapter 19 of the Mad Max novelization. Thank you for tuning in. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. It's around that time when this is being recorded. Uh, peace, hair grease. We love you. And that's it.